In this lecture, I would like to do an introduction to rockets. I'll be focusing more on the rockets that took people to the moon. Let's start with a brief history of rockets. The earliest known use of rockets is in China, perhaps beginning even earlier than the 13th century. Rockets were first developed in the Song Dynasty, which was around between the year 960 to 1279. On the right is a picture of the Long Serpent rockets which were arrows with rockets mounted on their sides. As such, the first documented use of rockets is in warfare. Continuing this trend of rockets being used for battle, in India, Mysorean rockets were used against British forces in 1780, as depicted on the left. Mysorean rockets were taken to the United Kingdom where they were developed as Congreve rockets. Those Congreve rockets were later used in the War of 1812 by the British forces against the United States. Having witnessed the use of those rockets at Fort McHenry in Baltimore, France Francis Scott Key wrote, and the rocket's red glare, into the American anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Next, I would like to talk about Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was a Russian Soviet high school math teacher. He pioneered much of the theory of rocketry. He's particularly known for the rocket equation, which is shown on the right. This equation is fundamental to rocketry and helps designers calculate the propellant required for a rocket for a given mass and for a given delta V, or change of velocity required. In the way that the equation is written above, the change in velocity that a rocket experiences, delta V, depends on VE, which is the velocity of the rocket exhaust, and the natural log of the ratio of the initial mass, mi, to the final mass, mf. The difference between the initial mass and the final mass is the mass of the propellant. I'd like to also note that there is a crater on the far side of the moon called Tsiolkovsky Crater in his honor. The crater is shown on the right. You'll notice that the crater is filled with dark basaltic lava. Next, I'd like to talk about Robert Goddard, who was a pioneer in rocketry in his own right. He also has a connection to high school education as noted in the quotation, which I will return to in a moment. Robert Goddard had numerous contributions to rocketry. One of his prominent contributions was the development of the first liquid-fueled rocket in 1926. He also has a connection to Baltimore, Maryland since he died here in 1945. Robert Goddard was heavily criticized when he was alive. On the left is a newspaper clipping from the front page of the New York Times on January 12, 1920. The article read, Believes Rocket Can Reach Moon. Smithsonian Institution tells of Professor Goddard's invention to explore upper air. The next day there was an editorial in the New York Times stating that Professor Goddard, with his, quote, chair in Clark College and the countenancing of the Smithsonian Institution, does not know the relation of action to reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. On July 17, 1969, only days before Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, the New York Times issued a correction. Towards the end of the Direction, it stated, further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century, and it is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. The correction was 24 years too late, since Robert Goddard died in 1945. We have talked about Werner von Braun. He developed the V-2 rocket for Nazi Germany. A schematic of the V-2 rocket is shown in the middle. The V-2 is the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. They were built by slave laborers from concentration camps. In production of this rocket, 12,000 to 20,000 people were killed. These rockets were aimed at mostly London, where 9,000 people died in the attacks of this rocket. After surrendering to the Americans after World War II, von Braun came to the United States. The rocketry work in the United States culminated in the development of the Saturn V rocket, shown on the right. Some of you may have read the comic series The Adventures of Tintin. There are two books in the series about traveling to the moon. One shown on the right is Explorers on the Moon. When Hergé wanted to have a rocket in his story, he looked to the V2 rocket for inspiration since that was what a rocket was at the time. I just wanted to take a moment to point out how choices we make with the technologies that we have have consequences in influencing and informing future future generations of what is possible. It is our responsibility to use our technologies for good. As we have seen, the early history of rockets is mostly comprised of them being used for warfare. It turns out that rockets can be used for purposes other than warfare. Shown here are the five rockets of the early U.S. human space program. The rockets are ordered according to the numbers shown above. First is the Redstone rocket, which was used for the first two Mercury missions of Al Shepard and Gus Grissom. The Redstone rocket was not very powerful, so both 
both of those flights were suborbital, meaning that they didn't go into orbit around the Earth. They went up to space, but then came back down while following a parabolic path. The Mercury program then moved on to the Atlas rocket. The Atlas, being more powerful, allowed astronauts to go into orbit for the rest of the Mercury missions, starting with John Glenn's Mercury 6 mission. After Project Mercury, NASA moved to the Gemini missions. Each Gemini mission had two astronauts instead of the one onboard Mercury spacecraft. All Gemini missions launched from the Titan rocket. For Project Apollo, two types of Saturn rockets were used. One was called the Saturn 1B, which was used for the Earth orbital Apollo 7 mission, and the other was the much more powerful Saturn 5 rocket. The Saturn 5 was used for Apollo 8 through Apollo 17. Let's look at the two Saturn rockets used for Apollo missions in a bit more detail. Let's consider the name Saturn. You may wonder why the rocket is called Saturn. The rocket is named after the planet Saturn. The US rocket program had a series of rockets called Jupiter. Jupiter C is shown on the left. When they were developing more powerful rockets, they wanted to move on to a different name. They used Saturn since it's the planet after Jupiter. Here's a list of all Apollo rocket launches divided by the two Saturn rockets that were used. Note that there were three uncrewed and unnamed Saturn 1B launches, followed by the uncrewed Apollo 5. Apollo 5 used the Saturn 1B that was attached to the Apollo 1 spacecraft. That is the mission where Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee died in the fire. Apollo 7 was the only Apollo mission to launch into space using a Saturn 1B rocket. There were two uncrewed Saturn 5 launches prior to Apollo 8. Apollo 8 and onward, all Apollo missions were launched using Saturn V rockets. This is footage I filmed on July 20th, 2019, on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This video should help you get a sense of scale of the Saturn 1B rocket. Let's take a look at a schematic of the Saturn 1B, so that we understand its major components. The Saturn 1B had two stages, and the spacecraft sat above the second stage. Let's consider each stage individually. The first stage of the Saturn 1B had eight engines. The stage used Rocket Propellant 1, or RP-1, as fuel. It's a form of kerosene. For oxidizer, it used liquid oxygen. Rocket stages primarily consist of tanks and engines, but there are other important components such as baffles to stop the liquid from sloshing. The second stage of the Saturn 1B had one engine. While the oxidizer was again liquid oxygen, the fuel was liquid hydrogen instead of rocket propellant 1. Note that the Saturn 1B's second stage was also the third stage of the Saturn 5 rocket. If you listen to or read Apollo mission audio or transcripts, they'll often say S4B, by which they are referring to this stage. Let's take a look at the Saturn V rocket. Please take a moment to take in the gigantic size of this rocket. The first stage of the Saturn V has five very large F1 engines. Those engines are to this day still the most powerful rocket engines ever made. Large rockets are generally unstable. Try balancing the tip of a pen or pencil on one finger and you'll get the basic idea. To make sure that large rockets are going in the correct direction, their engines are gimbaled. The four outer engines of the Saturn V were gimbaled giving the rocket the ability to steer itself. The Apollo spacecraft sat at the top of the Saturn V rocket. The cone-shaped part of the Apollo spacecraft, called the command module, was where the astronauts were during most of the mission. When they were going to land on the moon, two astronauts moved into the lunar module, or LEM, from the tunnel where people are peering inside in this video. At the back of the Apollo spacecraft is the engine that was used to get into and out of orbit around the moon. This engine used a hypergolic fuel and oxidizer, which means that the fuel and oxidizer ignited upon contact without the need for a spark or ignition source. This was a safety feature since there was only one one engine on the Apollo spacecraft and it was critical, particularly when leaving the moon's orbit. If this engine didn't work, then the astronauts wouldn't have had any other way of getting back home. The fuel used was a 50-50 combination of two types of hydrazine and the oxidizer was nitrogen tetroxide. The middle cylindrical portion of the Apollo spacecraft is the service module and as the name suggests, it housed propellants, fuel cells, and various support systems for the command module. You'll also notice there are small thrust on the sides of the service module, and those were used to change the Apollo spacecraft's pointing. This is how the three astronauts were seated during launch inside the command module. The mission commander was seated in the left seat, followed by the command module pilot and the lunar module pilot. 
Shown here are three dummies, but they help you get the idea of the small space astronauts had to work with during missions. While the Apollo spacecraft stayed in orbit around the moon, the spacecraft that landed on the moon was the lunar module, or LEM. It had two parts. The upper part was where the astronauts were and was the portion of the LEM that was used to leave the surface of the moon and meet back up with the Apollo spacecraft. The bottom part of the LEM primarily consisted of the propulsion system used to land on the moon. This is the Apollo 14 command module. As as you probably can tell, it has seen better days. Its current condition is largely due to the intense temperatures of coming back at a very high speed through the Earth's atmosphere. This is a schematic of the Saturn V rocket showing its main components. It had three stages compared to the two stages of the Saturn 1B rocket. The extra thrust via the third stage was necessary to get the Apollo spacecraft to the moon. Let's look at the stages individually. Like the Saturn 1B's first stage, the first stage of the Saturn V used a combination of rocket propellant 1 or RP-1, and liquid oxygen. It had five F-1 engines. The first stage took the astronauts to about 68 kilometers or 42 miles above sea level before it ran out of propellant and was jettisoned. The second stage of the Saturn V used a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as propellant and had five J-2 engines. It carried the astronauts to about 175 kilometers or 109 miles above sea level before it ran out of propellant and was jettisoned. Like the second stage, the third stage of the Saturn V also used a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as propellant. It had one J-2 engine. You may recall that this stage was also the second stage of the Saturn 1B rocket. This rocket put the Apollo spacecraft first into Earth orbit and then was shut off, while the Apollo spacecraft orbited the Earth and final checks were made before TLI, translunar injection. At the time of TLI, this stage reignited, giving the Apollo spacecraft sufficient energy to break away from Earth's gravitational pull and head towards the Moon. After its use, this stage was either directed into an orbit around the Sun or was purposely crashed onto the Moon to study the interior of the Moon using seismology. We should not ignore a very important interest stage ring that sat above the third stage. This instrument unit was the computer brain of the Saturn V and did the necessary calculations to guide the rocket. I found this model of the Saturn V at Kennedy Space Center very cool. The side panels of this model are transparent, so you can take a look at what is going on inside the rocket. This clip will end at the bottom of the second stage. Notice how much of the rocket is taken up by tanks for fuel and oxidizer. This clip continues from the bottom of the second stage onward. Let's take a look at rocket propulsion in a bit more detail. Rockets are essentially creating fire and using that heat energy to propel themselves forward. Generally, the three components for a fire are an oxidizer, like oxygen, a fuel, like liquid hydrogen, and a spark. Rockets typically need all three components to work. You are probably more familiar with other types of engines that do something similar in the sense that they also use an oxidizer, a fuel, and an ignition source to produce heat energy and then use that energy to propel a vehicle like a car or an airplane. On the left is a car engine where it takes a mixture of fuel, typically gasoline, also known as petrol, and an oxidizer, oxygen from the air, compresses that mixture and ignites it with a spark plug. The resulting burst of energy pushes the piston down which creates rotational motion that makes the wheels of the car rotate. A jet engine, in this case a particular type of jet engine used on commercial airplanes called the turbofan engine, does something similar. The turbofan engine takes in oxygen from the air, compresses it, combines that with fuel, and ignites the mixture. This produces energy that is used to push the engine and in turn the airplane itself forward. Unlike car engines and jet engines, rockets don't take their oxidizer from the air. Part of the reason is that large rockets are typically out of the Earth's atmosphere in a matter of minutes, and the other reason is that given the large quantity of fuel that, that rockets consume in a short period of time, it would be difficult to get the necessary oxygen from the atmosphere quickly. As such, rockets carry all three components, fuel, oxidizer, and an ignition source with them. Broadly speaking, there are two types of rockets. Historically, the older of the two is the solid fuel rocket. As we saw in the beginning of this lecture, these are the types of rockets that were developed early on in China and are used today at fireworks shows. The solid fuel rocket was the only type of rocket till 1926 when liquid fuel rockets were developed by Robert Goddard. As the name implies, in solid fuel rockets, the propellant is a solid. It's often a plastic-like material that has a combination of fuel and oxidizer. That means they just need to be ignited and they start going. One downside is that they are 
are generally hard to stop once they get going. They don't have the ability to stop and restart, as was required by the Saturn V's third stage. On the other hand, liquid-fueled rockets can be restarted, and they were the primary means of propulsion for the Apollo program. While liquid-fueled rockets are complicated due to a number of reasons, including the multiple tanks, pipes, and pumps, they are very powerful. Before we end today, let's look at the various steps in the Apollo flight path. This image is not easy to see, so I encourage you to use the link below to download the image for yourselves. Let's take a look at the four main steps individually. The first step is to get into Earth orbit. You will see a depiction of the Saturn V's first stage burning and being jettisoned into the ocean. Next, the second stage is used and discarded into the ocean. The third stage burns for a short time to give the spacecraft sufficient velocity to go into Earth orbit. After final check, the third stage reignites, giving the spacecraft sufficient velocity to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. On the way to the Moon, the Apollo spacecraft comes off the third stage and turns around 180 degrees. This is done to align the top of the Apollo spacecraft with the lunar module, which was sitting below the Apollo spacecraft during launch. The Apollo spacecraft docks with the lunar module and extracts it. As mentioned, for some of the Apollo missions, the third stage, or S-4B, was directed into an orbit around the Sun, and for other missions, the stage was purposely crashed onto the moon. Once the Apollo spacecraft got close to the moon, the Apollo spacecraft's engine was fired to slow down and get captured into orbit around the moon. After some time, two astronauts got into the lunar module and detached from the Apollo spacecraft. While the Apollo spacecraft stayed in lunar orbit, the lunar module landed on the surface. After surface operations were completed, the two astronauts on the moon flew back to the Apollo spacecraft using the upper portion of the lunar module. That portion of the lunar module was jettisoned once the two astronauts were back inside the Apollo spacecraft. The Apollo spacecraft's engine was then fired to break away from the moon's gravitational pull and to head back home. When close to the Earth, the bottom portion of the Apollo spacecraft, the service module, was jettisoned. The command module then came through the atmosphere and landed in the ocean where the astronauts were picked up by ship. 